Good morning. If you guys have the slide deck open, go ahead and refresh it. I just made some tiny changes. Um, it's not a, not a big deal if you don't get them, but, um, okay. So today we're going to continue talking about Java objects, and we're going to have a chance today to explore one of the more interesting features of Java's type system and Java's object model. And this is something that um, is one of the first times in the class, it's not gonna be the last time, for sure, where we start to see connections with some really beautiful theory in computer science. There's actually a Turing Award winner that we're gonna talk about today, whose work is related to our discussion of Java's type system. So this is kind of neat. Again, this is something that we'll certainly continue to do throughout the semester. Um, because now that we've got through some of the programming basics, we're gonna start to have a chance to talk about uh, some higher level ideas, some deeper concepts, um, and this is gonna bring us at various points throughout the class into contact with some of the more interesting conceptual challenges in this field, some of the theory that people have been working on uh, for multiple decades. Okay, I wanna start off though by reviewing the homework problem from not yesterday but the day before. As I've said several times, one of the reasons we talk about static, I mean, we talk about static because it's a useful feature when you're designing objects and designing classes, but one of the reasons we talk about it is because it should really help you understand Java objects and how they work. So as I've been sort of watching people talk about the homework on the forum, which is totally fine, by the way, uh, please try not to post, like, all of your code on the day the homework um, is still out, but you can certainly have discussions about it. We're, we're cool with that. Um, but I, I noticed sometimes where people were kind of like, oh, I tried it with static, and then I took static off, and it worked, so I just, you know, fine, right? So static is not a keyword that you just sort of, like, stick in and stick out and see kind of, like, which one passes the test cases, right? We actually want to try to understand how this is working. So let's go over um, homework 25, which was kind of a fun little homework problem, I think, because it brought us back to some of the imperative programming we did before. This is not a hard piece of code to write. Some of you made it more difficult than it needed to be. Um, but, so, the, the description said, you're supposed to design a class called last 10, and that class is supposed to store, this is somewhat similar to the storage examples we were doing in class, the last 10 integers. So it provides a method called add, that allows me to add an integer, and it also provides a method called get last 10, which should return an array containing the last 10 values that were added. Now, whenever we give you, or you see this type of thing, we give you method signatures. What do you not see here? I see void add it new value, so I know that the name of the function I need to create is add. It's not supposed to return anything, it's supposed to take an int, it says add a new integer to the values that we are remembering, and I see a second method that returns a one-dimensional array of integers called get last 10, doesn't take any arguments. What's not present here? It's a hint about how these methods are supposed to work. Well, there's no constructor, okay, so that's, that was left up to you to do. What's missing from these method signatures? Because, yeah. No, there's, so there's no visibility modifiers, right? Um, we did say that you're supposed to implement two public methods, so it's a hint on how to do that. What's not present here? Static. So there's, there's no indication that these are class methods. If we give you a signature like this, your assumption should be that they're instance methods. So what does this mean? This means that every instance of last 10 remembers its own 10 integers and provides its own add and get methods, right? We're gonna do this example in a minute. We'll see how this goes wrong if you use static, okay? And our test case is tested for this, all right? Okay, so here's my main method. What I'm doing here is I'm gonna create a new instance of last 10. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna run this in a loop where I add some integers to it. This is roughly what the test we did. It was a little bit trickier than this. Um, 
And then I'm using this uh, helper um, class, and we'll talk about packages next week. But I'm using an import here. This just gives me a nice way to print off the result of running this. Uh, right now, obviously, this is not going to compile because I haven't defined last 10. But let's do that. All right, so we're going to create a class called last 10. Um, I told you to provide an empty constructor. In this case, you actually don't need to do anything in the constructor. So there's no, actually no need to even provide it. Um, I know that I need to provide a public void method called add that takes a new value. So this is not a bad way to start when we're starting the implementation of a class, is to figure out, you know, what's the interface that the class provides. I'll go back and look at the documentation again. This is called get last 10. Takes no arguments, returns an array of integers. All right, so this is the, you know, we talk about objects as combining state and behavior, data and algorithms. So this is the behavior, the algorithms, the, the things that this class is able to do. I'm able to ask it to add a value, and then I'm able to uh, ask it for the last 10 values that I've added. What state do I need to add to this class in order to get it to work? So this is very common, actually, and this is something we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about Java interfaces. This is something you guys are seeing on MP3. Javadoc, in particular, or the documentation for a class, or when you go out into the world and you're working at a company and your boss says, I need you to do this, a lot of times what the conversations you're gonna have are about what we call the public interface to the class, or the way that somebody else would use it. How you structure it internally is up to you. All the test suite cares about is that there's a method called add that it can call that takes a single int argument, and then there's a method called get last 10 that when it calls it will get a reference back to an array that contains the last 10 values that were added. How you lay out everything else, how you implement this is totally up to you, and there were a couple different ways to do this. But what's one piece of private state that this class probably needs? If it's gonna store 10 integer values. Yeah. No, we're not gonna use an array list. We're gonna use an array. So I need to store integers, right? Actually, there's no need to use an array list for this class. You know, the, the array's pretty simple. We're, we're gonna see this together. So we need an array, list, and we're gonna use an array. And I can just use this syntax, so I need to give it a name, don't I? I'm gonna call this values. And I can use, I can do this type of initialization in the class. I could also do it in the constructor, either way. Okay, so I have an array of integers. What else do I need? Yeah, sure. Nope. Nope. If I create a Java array of integers, it's initialized to zero by default. Yeah. Good question. It could initialize it if you wanted to be really thorough about it, but there's no need. All right, so what else do I probably need? What else? Yeah. Yeah, some sort of counter, because this was also, and a lot of you didn't see this part of the problem, which I think is too bad, um, but you'll see it now. This is also a chance for us to uh, use our modular arithmetic. So I'm gonna say private int, and I'm gonna call this index. I'm gonna initialize it to zero. So this is the spot in my array where I'm gonna put the next value. When I start off, the first empty slot in the array is zero, and as I go on, I'm incrementing it every time I put something in the array. Now, what happens when this index, so I can start writing my add function. I can say values index is equal to new value. So I've saved the value that you called me with. That's good, step one. What do I do next? Need to update my index. So I could just say index plus plus, and this will work precisely 10 times. 
until index becomes what value? 10, right? When index is 10, I'm trying to put a value into the 11th spot in the array, and I'm gonna get an array index out of bounds exception at this point. So what do I need to do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually don't need an if statement here. Let's try it cleaner. Yep. Let's do it right here. Bingo. Yeah, I saw a lot of solutions that looped through the array and moved everything over. It's totally unnecessary. The problem said you don't have to return them in the order they were added. You can return them in any order. You just have to return the last 10 values. Last 10 values that were added using add in any order. So this, and then here, what do I do? I return, I return my values. I'll use, and that is the, that is the solution. That's all there is to it, two lines. Okay, so, at this point, making, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna perform some experiments here. We're gonna see what happens. So what's gonna happen if I make this piece of private state static. Will this work right now? Who thinks it will? Yeah, it's gonna work fine. I'm gonna get the same answer I just got. What is gonna cause it to break? Yeah. Yep, so let's do this. Okay, we're gonna do another last 10. We'll do another last 10 dot add. And just so I can distinguish between these, I'm gonna add 10 times the value. <coughs> so now, because the values is static, there's only one copy of it that both of these instances are sharing. However, each one still has its own index, which is weird. So how is this going to work? Who can, who, who wants to make a bold prediction about what's gonna be printed when I'm done? Again, we're gonna experiment with both wrong iterations of this. All right? Yeah. Yeah, so let's see what happens here. So all of the values are from my second instance. They're all the ones that are multiplied by 10. Why? So let's think about what happens every time I call add. So both instances have their own index. So what happens the first time I call add is the first instance puts a value into index zero, and it increments its own counter. The second instance puts a value into index zero as well, overwriting the one that was put in there by the first instance. So if I change these, and I put this one second, then I'm gonna see values from the second, uh, the, the smaller values. Does this make sense? If this hurts your brain a little bit, this is worth thinking about for a while, yeah. In this case, it doesn't matter. Actually, let's try it. That's a good question. So, so what Lorenzo is saying is I'm always, makes no difference, right? Why doesn't it make a difference? It's a great question. Why doesn't this matter? I don't even need to use an instance here, right? I could do this. Well, no, the method is still static, aha. The method is not static. So the method's an instance method, but it's using the static array. 
So again, in this case, both instances are sharing one array of values, but they're not sharing a counter. So the second one keeps overwriting. Whichever add I call second in my loop is gonna overwrite the values from the previous one. Okay, let's try changing the index to static, all right? So now I have a static array of values, I also have a static index. Now what's gonna happen? Now I'm gonna see something different. Let's make a prediction about, yeah, that. Right, so now they're gonna interleave. So when I run this, yep. So I see the first one is a value that was added by another last 10. The second one is the value that was added by last 10. And they're going back and forth. So the first time I call add, my, there's only one counter now, there's only one index. So the first time I call add, the index is zero, it becomes one. The next time I call add, the index is one, it becomes two. So now they're not overwriting each other's values, but they're still, um, they're, they're still sharing one array. Okay, so I've almost done all the permutations. What about this one? It's the last one. So we looked at the case where they were both instance variables, we've looked at the case where they were both static variables, we looked at the case where the array was static and the index was an instance variable, and now this will work too. The array is an instance variable, the index is static, what am I gonna see now? You wanna make a, make a bold, brave prediction? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna skip things. Right, so if I print this guy, I see I've got a value that was added and then a zero, and another value that was added and a zero. Because they're sharing the counter. Let's look at what happens if we print off the other one. This will be a good example. So let's print off both last 10 and other last 10. So you can see that one of them is filling the even indices, zero, two, four, six, eight. The other one is filling the odd indices, one, three, five, seven, nine. They're sharing the same count. So again, if, if this doesn't make sense to you, I would sit down with this example and mess around with it, put some print statements into it until you are really confident that you understand why this behaves the way it behaves. Because again, this is a really, really important moment to kind of make sure that you solidify your understanding of the difference between an instance of an object and the class itself, which can also have its own fields. Questions about this before we go on? I will try to come up with some more questions that sort of tease out this, um, this distinction for you to work on on the homework problems. Think about how to do it. Okay, cool. So last time we started talking about inheritance and we, pointed out that there are benefits to organizing things into a hierarchy. In particular, it can be a natural expression of real-world hierarchies, but more importantly in computer science, it allows us to organize our classes in a way that minimizes the amount of code we have to duplicate. So a lot of times, you know, when you're, when you're building a certain type of system, you notice that there are similarities between the various types of entities that you're working with. And if you set up an object hierarchy carefully, you can move a lot of the shared code into a parent class, and then the children inherit that shared behavior from the parent and provide their own small modifications to it. And this is something that we'll give you some examples of as we go along in the homework and in class. So it turns out that if we were, you could do this. I felt like this would be a fun project to do for the Java library. I've actually looked around. I've never found this, but you can take all the Java classes that you work with, everything you work with in Java except those primitive types, and you can organize them into a tree. So a tree is a data structure that we'll have a lot more to say about later in the class. But in this case, a tree means that every object has a parent, and every object's parent has a parent until you get to the root. Every tree, this, and this, and this, every tree of this kind has a single root. 
And in Java, the root is an object that's called object, capital. This is the Java object. It is the superclass of everything. There is one object at the top of the tree, and every other Java object inherits from it in some way. If you don't explicitly extend another class, then you still inherit from object. So the extends keyword allows you to choose another class to inherit from, <clears throat> but if you don't make that choice, Java, in order to preserve this hierarchy, which we're gonna point out in a few minutes, has some really important implications, will implicitly have that class extend object. So these two are essentially the same. You never have to explicitly extend object. You always will implicitly extend object if you don't extend another class, and if you extend another class, then if you go to your parent class and go to the parent's parent, go to the parent's parent, if you start on your way up, you will eventually get to object. So this is what explains that mystery that we pointed out last time, which is that why does an object that I create have this method that I haven't defined anywhere, these two, this two-string method? So it turns out that there are a small but extremely important number of methods that the object class implements. And so every Java object has these methods. There are three of them that are important to us for this class. Okay, so, you know, again, I can do this. I can use this two-string method. My dog class has never declared this method. But it's inherited from objects. So there's, there's three of them that were, now there's not only three, there's actually quite a, you know, maybe like 10, I think. But there's three that are important for our purposes, right? First one, two string. So every single Java object can return a representation of itself as a string. Why? What is this for? Why is this a useful thing? Again, these, these methods are so critical that Java actually has object implement them so that every single Java object has this. So every single Java object you can call to string and you can return some type of string representation. But why is this so important? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's not often that the to string method provided by Java is that useful. Right? Usually we have to provide our own methods. But what is this for? Why do I want to be able to represent every single thing in my program potentially as a string? When am I going to use this? Just want to point out as a hint, this is not a useful feature for building applications. You don't write two strings so the user can see a string printed out by your object. That's typically not what two string is for. What is it for then? Yeah, so this is really about development. The reason why every object provides a two-string method is for you, the developer, the programmer, as you're working with your code fixing bugs, it's helpful to, at times to be able to print something. I've got this problem caused by some object I was working with, and I want to kind of understand what was happening. I'm putting in some printlin methods. I can print anything in Java. So printlin in Java will accept anything. You can print anything in Java. Now again, as we've seen up till this point, the output that comes out of print is not always that helpful. But it can be, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Okay. Equals. Equality. What does it mean for two objects to be equal to each other? So this is something else that Java sort of requires that every object implement. So there's an so in all of these cases, the object superclass provides an implementation of this function for us. That implementation provided by object is frequently not very useful. And we'll talk about the default to string implementation, which you guys have seen the output from already at times. It's kind of sort of frightening. Um, we'll also talk about the equals function later. We talk about uh, some of the things that we can do with objects. So 
equals returns a Boolean indicating whether this object is the same as some other object. And finally, this interesting function called hash code. And this is something that we will talk about later. Hashing is a beautiful topic. Um, we'll do some coverage of that later in the semester. But the idea behind hash code, explained as simply as possible, is that every Java object is required to be able to return an integer that uniquely identifies it, that can be used uh, in other places. And we'll see how this unique identifier can be extremely useful when we talk a little bit later about hashing and about maps. All right, so these are the three that we're gonna focus. Now, if you look up Java object, there's actually Java doc about it, and you can see there's a number of other functions that Java object also provides. But for our purposes, purposes of this class, these are the ones that are critical. So as I pointed out, it's rare that the default implementation, so whenever you create a new class in Java, you get these methods for free. You get a toString method, you get an equals method, you get a hash code method. It's rare that the ones that you inherit from object are useful. Usually, they're not. The equals method that the Java object superclass provides is extremely restrictive. It's very, very rare that it's actually how you wanna test for equality between your objects. Same thing with toString. We've seen what toString prints when you don't implement it. It prints the name of the class, and then it prints a memory address where the class is located. That's not that helpful. It doesn't tell us a lot about the class. So what we normally do is, and you guys have, some of you that have started MP3 have probably been seeing this, we override them. So a Java class is allowed to modify the functions and the behaviors provided by its parent classes. This is called overriding. So just because you get a toString method from object doesn't mean that that's the toString method that you want your class to use. And so you are welcome to write your own toString method. You have to use the same signature. And what'll happen is, at runtime, Java will use your toString method rather than the one provided by object. So here's an example. ToString, the method signature of toString is that it's a public method that's supposed to return a string. It takes no arguments. It's an instance method. And so in this case, I might say, you know, when I print off a dog object, an instance of a dog class, what I really want to know is its name. So that's what I return. So now if I do system.out.println on a reference to a dog, what I'll see is the name. Jeremy. Ah, okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this, right? So the question is, why can't I just create a different method called get name or something like that and have it return a string and use that? It's a great question, and we will, we will, this will hopefully become clear within the next lecture between today and Monday. All right, so, so hold that, hold that thought. So now we can talk a little bit more about how Java does name resolution. So the Java type hierarchy is used when I'm resolving the names of variables and methods. So the first thing that Java says is, does that class provide a variable or method with the right name? And in the case of a method, I also look for something with the right signature, okay? If so, that's what I use. If not, I move up to the next level of the hierarchy. So if I don't find a method in your class, I look at your parent. I say, does the parent provide that method with the right signature? Now, I also have to keep in mind that these searches are limited by these accessibility modifiers. So when I'm looking on your class, right, I'm also thinking, who's calling this? So if that call is coming from outside, I'm gonna ignore private methods. If it's calling from a method, if it's coming from a method on your class, I allow it to call private methods. So this search is, you know, bounded by the visibility methods we've talked about so far. So if my parent provides a method with the right signature, but it's private, Java will keep looking. I continue up the tree. So I go to your parent, I go to your parent, I go to your parent, you have multiple ancestors, until I get to object. At that point, the search stops. So I either find a method with the right signature that is, that I'm allowed to use, or a variable with the right name that I'm allowed to use, or I fail. And if I fail, you get one of these error messages. 
Okay. So here's an example of this. I've set up some, you know, fairly silly but meaningful um, multiple inheritance. So I've got an animal class here. Animal extends what class? Doesn't declare that it extends a class, therefore it's descended from object. So animal's parent is object. Animal provides a two-string method, though. It's overriding the object two-string method. Then I have cl a class called pet that extends animal. I have a class called dog that extends pet. Old dog extends dog. Sweet old dog extends old dog. Could have sweet old dog that sometimes a bad dog extends sweet old dog. Um, so my main method creates an instance of sweet old dog and then calls this two-string method on it. And so here's what Java does. Java says, does sweet old dog provide a method called toString with the right signature? Takes no arguments, returns a string. Actually, it takes no arguments. Remember, the return type is not part of the method signature. Sorry, bad professor. It doesn't. So where does it look next? So I started in sweet old dog. Where do I look now? Look in old dog. Does old dog provide that method? Where do I look next? Dog. Does dog provide that method? Nope. Where do I look next? Pet. Does pet provide that method? Nope. Where do I look next? Animal. Does animal provide that method? It does. Right. So when I run this, what you're going to see is it's going to print, I'm an animal. The search stops as soon as I find something that works. So let's put something in here so we can see how this works. Let me change this to... So now what happened is I went from sweet old dog to old dog to dog and I found that method. Okay? Remember, this is bounded by our visibility modifiers, so if I mark this as private, what's gonna happen now? What do you think? If I mark it as private, I'm gonna skip it. I can't access that method. But I'm not done looking. I keep going to the next level up to the next level. Question? That's a good question. I don't know. We can, we can play with it in the middle. We're about, we're about to go back and talk about method overriding. So the question is, if I can't find a method that works, that has the right types, but I can cast those types safely to other types that work, do I keep looking for a method or do I do the cast first? I don't know. Try it and let me know. It's a good question. We can try it in a minute if you want. So, okay, so what's gonna happen, so I remember two string is one of the functions that every Java object has, like, will provide. Because eventually what's gonna happen is I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep going, and I'm gonna get to object. And object is gonna provide this method for me. And again, this is not a particularly useful string. It's sort of useful, it's not useless. What does it tell me? It tells me the class, the type of this particular variable, and then it tells me a memory address. Again, like, not, not particularly helpful information. So this is why it's very common for classes to override things like, oop, two string. Questions about this before we move on forward? Awesome, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, I thought I fixed this. Okay, I didn't. There's some duplicate slides. All right, so, so now we're at the point where we get to talk about one of these cool concepts in Java. This is something that, you know, we're, we're gonna give you guys practice with, we're gonna see multiple times. Um, it's got a big sort of complicated name. It's not really that complicated. The name of this concept is polymorphism. Literally what that word means is the ability to act like multiple things. Poly is multi, morphism, morph, change, right? So this, what this means is that 
you know, and the definition of this, the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. So we're gonna talk more about interfaces next week and specifically what they mean in Java. But for now, I wanna point out a couple of examples where we've been using polymorphism already. So the first case is when we talk about objects. We pointed out that every object in Java is an instance of at least two types, except if I really just create an object. The class itself and object. So depending on the context, a class can always act as itself or object. And it turns out that a class can also morph or act as any of its ancestors. So if I create an instance of dog, I can pass that to a function that requires a pet as an argument. Does that make sense? I can pass it to any function that requires an object as an argument. Because what happens is when that call is running, that object morphs into an instance of one of those other types. Now, I can't do this for any two types in Java. I have to have this relationship. I can only morph into classes that are my ancestors. And there's a very specific reason why this is the case, right? So this piece of code is going to work. Now, it's interesting, it's gonna work, right? So what do we have here? I have uh, a couple of small classes that I've set up up top to create a little bit of a hierarchy. So I have a pet class, and I have a dog class that extends pet. And down here, I create an instance of dog, and I create an instance of pet. And then I pass them both to the static method called print anything. What is the type signature of print anything? What type of argument does it require? It says public static void print anything, it doesn't return anything. It takes an argument of what type? Object. So why am I allowed to call this? Because I don't have an instance of type object on line 11, I have an instance of type dog. I don't have an instance of type object on line 12 either, I have an instance of type pet. So why am I allowed to do this? Yeah, so this is polymorphism. What's happening is those objects are automatically transforming into the object class. And they can do this because they descend from objects. So this is something that's referred to as an upcast. In Java, if I take an object and I want to treat it as one of its ancestors, I don't have to do anything special. I can just pass it to a function that takes one of its ancestors as an argument, and everything will work. So again, this is upcasting. The reason we call it upcasting, we're casting up the tree. So I'm casting, I'm implicitly casting an instance of dog to an object which is dog's parent's parent. I'm implicitly casting an instance of pet to type object, which is pet is, object is pet's parent. All right, so again, this will work. Now here's the thing that's interesting about this. So you might have wondered, once I cast it to an object, does it lose its true nature? Because Choo Choo is actually a dog, right? Ziz is actually a pet. She'd probably be pissed at me. There's no cat class in here. I'm more, I'm more than a pet. I'm a cat. I'm a fetal form. Um, so I'm calling the toString method on this object instance. But in the first case, I'm not getting the toString method. I'm getting the toString method that's provided by dog. Sorry, I'm not getting the default object toString method. I'm getting the toString method that's called, that's defined on my dog class. So even when Java objects are morphing, even when we're exploiting this polymorphism, even when my pet, instance of the pet class is acting like an object, it's still a pet. It hasn't lost its implementation of toString. Now, pet doesn't have an implementation of toString, but dog does. And so, when I call print anything on line 11 and I pass it dog, the toString method that's defined on the dog class still works. Right, so this is important to understand, okay? 
Yes, but instances retain their types. So even when I'm upcasting an instance, it still retains the features of that class. So if I've over, particularly if I've overridden object methods. Okay. So I want to go back here and I want to come back to Jeremy's question from earlier in the lecture, which was, why not just create a print name or something like that method? The reason is because a Java object defines two string, because the object class, which is the superclass of every other class in Java, defines two string. I know that I can always call two string on any Java object and get back some string representation of it. So if I name that method print name, but only some objects had it and some objects didn't, now I have a problem. So two string, because it's defined by object, allows any Java object to print be printed. And it allows any code in Java to print a Java object without having to know anything else about it. All I have to know here to write this method is that object has a two-string method. I accept an object, and now this will be able to print any object in Java. I don't need to know anything else about it. I don't know what that string is going to look like. That's up to the object itself. But I know that I can call that method. Does that help, Jeremy? Okay, this, this is a complicated concept. We'll come back to it. All right. So here, I've actually done an, uh, another type, you know, ex example of a cast. So I create a dog on line nine, instance of a dog, and then I create another reference to it on line 10 that's an object. And then I'm gonna print it as an object, and then I'm gonna print it as a pet, and I'm gonna print it um, and in both of those cases, it's still a dog. So Java still knows what kind of class this is, even if it's morphing into one of its parent classes. Okay. So I can also cast an object down. So I can also take an object that maybe I've casted up to an object, and I can cast it down to a different type. This is trickier, though, because the downcast has to be safe. So I can't take an object and cast it down another, a kind of like another route on the tree. I can only cast it down if it was, a, if that cast is on the way to where the object actually lives in the tree. I didn't explain that very well, but maybe we'll do an example here. All right? So what are we doing here? We're creating an, so I'm, I'm, I'm creating, I'm actually calling the dog constructor, but I'm storing an object reference, okay? So on line 11, what I'm doing is I'm downcasting my choo-choo instance to a pet. And this is okay because choo-choo's actually a dog. Even though I'm pretending that he's an object at that point, I'm downcasting, I'm still on the way to where the dog lives in the tree. And then on line 13, I can do that cast again and it will still work. So this is downcasting. Oop, sorry. All right, so let's try doing this in a way that won't work. So imagine instead of creating Choo Choo initially as a dog, I create him as a pet. So he's not an instance of dog. I can still cast him down to a pet on line 11. That's fine. I cannot cast him further down to a dog on line 13 because it's not a dog. So here, I will get a runtime error. If you ran this on IntelliJ, it would tell you a little bit more information about what's wrong. I can't, I, fundamentally, Choo Choo can't act like a dog because he's not a dog. In this case, he's a pet. If I change him back to a dog again, I'm good. Okay, we have five minutes left. It's a good time to introduce to sort of bring us to the point where we're actually bringing in a really cool piece of computer science theory, the theory of programming language design. So this is something that's sometimes known as the Liskov substitution principle. And the idea here is that in an object-oriented system with this type of type model, if S is a subtype of T, so that means S descends from T, 
then I can replace objects of type T with objects of type S without altering any of the desirable properties of T. So S descends from T. Let's make this concrete. Let's say S is dog and T is an object. So dog descends from object. Then I can replace objects of, of type dog with objects of type object without altering any of the desirable properties of the system. So what does this mean with two string? So a desirable property of T in this case is the fact that I can print it. It has a two string method. And because every single Java object descends from the object parent class, I can substitute any of them um, with an instance of object and still get that two string method. So I never lose the desirable property, which is that I can always print any object. Now there's one thing here that this relies on that you might have noticed or you might think about. It's one really important principle of the Java type system that I'm relying on here. Can anyone tell what it is? So I talked about the fact that when I inherit from an object, I get its methods and its state. I can override those methods, so I can provide my own implementation. But what can I not do? There's something that Java objects cannot do. You can provide your own two-string implementation, that's cool. But what can you not do? Yeah. You can't decide you're not gonna implement two-string. Too bad. You can't be like, you know what? I don't wanna be printed. I don't wanna be objectified that way. I'm not gonna implement two-string. I'm just gonna remove it entirely. Nobody can call it on me. You can't do that. It's impossible. If you could do that, Java's type system would not have this feature. And we'd lose a lot of the desirable properties that we want. So this is an interesting corollary here. In Java and other systems that use this type of type model, I can decide how to implement toString, but I can't decide whether or not to implement toString. All right, I've got two minutes left, which is a perfect amount of time. Well, actually, it probably should have an entire hour to do this, but I introduce you to Barbara Liskoff, the namesake of the Liskoff substitutability principle. She was one of the first women in the United States to get a doctorate in computer science. Um, last time I checked, she was teaching at MIT. She was also a winner for this work and other contributions to programming languages of the highest award in computer science, something called the Turing Award. How many people have heard of the Turing Award before? Okay, well, now we have that number to 100%. So the Turing Award is computer science's equivalent of the Nobel Prize. It's given every year. There is no Nobel Prize in computing. I don't know if that makes any sense. The Nobel Prizes predate our field by quite a, quite a long period of time. I would encourage you to check this out. If you go through the list of people that have won this award, it's a great way to get a really beautiful overview of computing as a field and the major achievements in computer science. So last year, they haven't announced the 2018 winner yet. Last year, um, two computer scientists, John Hennessy and David Patterson, shared this award for contributions to um, computer architecture and microprocessor design, right? Um, a couple years earlier, so Tim Berners-Lee, some of you may have heard of the World Wide Web. That was one of his brainchilds. So these people have made enormous lasting contributions to the field. And again, if you go through this list, you'll learn a lot about the various types of things that computer science care about and the various types of really notable achievements in, in our field over time. Okay, I am going to stop here and we'll come back and talk about polymorphism again on Monday. MP3 is due on Monday. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Early deadline on Monday, right? 40 points. MP3 is due a week from Monday. Um, I have office hours today starting now. Next Wednesday, hold on, we will not have class here. I may or may not record a video lecture, so it depends on how Monday goes, but we will not meet for class. I'll remind you of that. I have a sense that the next class in here has a midterm today, so let's try to clear out of here as fast as we can. I will see you on Monday. Have a great